All right, turn in your Bible this morning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We went over this in our weekly Bible study and I and it kind of prompted a <coughs> message idea. I've been wanting to say something about this for a while now, a couple subjects, and this kind of prompted it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 and 2. I'm going to talk this morning about discerning the times and the seasons what this message is going to be on this morning. Okay, verse 1 says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Okay, Paul is writing to the Thessalonian believers here. And if you jump up there to chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, he mentions the rapture there. But he's saying... You know, these times that are coming, the times and the seasons, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord come, so cometh as a thief in the night. And then he goes into, down through the verses there, we're not going to read them all, but about ye are the children of light, we're not as others, you know, we don't, we're not sleeping in the night, we're not drunken like others, and there's, that's a very interesting study. We're not going to get into all that today. Uh, but you see there the thing of that you are to know perfectly the day of the Lord. Now turn back to Acts chapter 1. And the day of the Lord, by the way, uh, I'm going to define this in just a little bit, but the day of the Lord is the a reference to the millennial kingdom and, the, and it starts with the second coming of Jesus Christ. So that's the day of the Lord. And you'll see that in just a little bit. I'll, I'll define that. But Acts chapter six, or I'm sorry, Acts chapter one, verses six through seven says, "When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in His own power." Now wait a second. I thought Paul said that they're to know the times and the seasons perfectly. And yet here, Jesus says that they don't know the times or the seasons. Is that a contradiction? No, it's not a contradiction. Okay, why? Well, if you study the thing, read down through there, over to Acts chapter 2, they had not yet received the Holy Ghost. Okay, look at verse 8, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the other, uttermost part of the earth. You see, the gospel was first taken to the Jews. So why were they not able to know the times or the seasons yet? Well, because it was still an open thing there. The gospel had to first be presented to the Jews and then it was up to them to accept or reject. And... This is kind of a weird thing to think about because we have the completed revelation. But I believe that the gospel, at this point in time, Acts chapter 1, I think that if the Jews, if the nation of Israel would have accepted Jesus as their Messiah, there's a possibility that it would never have come directly to the Gentiles and that the nation of Israel would have been forsaken. See, I believe in free will. Okay? And you have to realize a lot of your New Testament, most of your New Testament was not yet written at this point. So the gospel was first offered to the Jews. That's why they couldn't know the time. But by the time 1 Thessalonians shows up, by the time Paul's writing to the believers in Thessalonica, now the nation of Israel has rejected, and now the Lord has a new plan. Okay, But it would not have been just of God to say... Uh, I know the nation of Israel is going to reject, and so you don't have any chance. And so, No, he allowed them to make the decision for themselves. That's why it's not a contradiction. They knew in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, but they didn't know here in Acts chapter 1. Okay, not a contradiction. All right, now, it says there in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2, that we are to know the times and seasons perfectly. Okay, how is that possible, by the way, without a perfect Bible? How can you really know about prophecy if there's no such thing as a perfect Bible? 
Yes, there is a perfect Bible. It's the King James Bible. Now, if I asked you what time it is right now, what would you do? You'd look at your watch. Okay? You'd look at a clock. But now, as a Christian, spiritually, if I ask you what time is it, what do you look to? You look to the Bible. You don't look to some prophet or something like that that's up there trying to get your money. You look to the Bible, to the Word of God. Jump over to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 16 through 20. Okay, Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 20 says, And here Peter, by the way, is speaking to the Jews. Okay, that's, that's who's gathered there at the day of Pentecost. It's a Jewish feast day. Verse 16, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, now how those events happened in the past no they haven't happened yet but peter was preaching them reading from the book of joel okay and and this stuff is written back in there if you want to study the book of joel sometime but he was reading those things and saying this stuff's going to happen before the day of the lord come and it will by the way but these things have not happened yet now if the nation of israel would have accepted Jesus as their Messiah, it would have probably taken place in the first century. But they rejected Jesus Christ as a nation. There were a lot of Jews that got saved in the first century. But as a nation, nationally, they rejected Jesus Christ. Most of them feared the Jewish leaders in the synagogue, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees. They feared them, and they didn't want to be put out of the synagogues, much like a lot of modern Christians today fear the majority of Christian preachers and they don't want to be put out of the churches and that's why they won't take a stand for the truth. Okay? It's the same thing. Alright? It's just the way it is. But if they would have rejected or if they, excuse me, if they would have accepted Jesus Christ, I believe these events would have happened back then. But of course they didn't accept Jesus Christ. They will in the time of Jacob's trouble which is coming. Alright? Okay. But let's continue on here. Um... Now, I said earlier about the day of the Lord. We're not going to turn there for sake of time, but Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So the day of the Lord, as I stated earlier, is the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. Now, that can't begin until Jesus Christ shows up. So, having said all of that, we don't know the day of the rapture. And we're going to get into one of the prophecies made by a false prophet in just a little bit. Um, but we cannot say when the day of the rapture is. But the times and the seasons mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it talks about the day of the Lord. So in other words, it's not the times and the seasons of the rapture, it's the times and the seasons of that day of the Lord. That we can look and we can see Hmm, all these events are starting to come to pass here that's leading up to the day of the Lord, to Christ's second coming. So seeing that, we know that, hey, the rapture must be pretty near. It's getting very close now. You know, I heard it said this way the one time a, a guy said, uh, he said, if you're going on a trip and you, you're heading for such and such a place and you know that there's, and you see a road sign that's a place beyond your destination. But there's no sign for the place that you're going to. Well, you know, you can know, hey, I'm getting I'm not going to let's say you're you're in Pennsylvania here and you're you want to go out to Ohio and you see a road sign for uh Indiana. Indiana, yeah. You know, well, I'm not headed to Indiana. I'm gonna be getting off before then. But I see Indiana coming up, you know. Same thing there. 
we can see the second coming approaching very rapidly, and we know that we're going to be leaving at some point before the second coming. So the second coming, the more signs of that that we see, the closer we know we're getting to the rapture. Okay. So you say, what are some of these signs of Christ's second coming? Well, the probably the greatest, most turned to and most under, misunderstood chapter in the entire Bible on the second coming is Matthew 24. So go to Matthew chapter 24. I've done a whole study on this verse by verse. and You can listen to that uh, here on Sermon Audio. Uh, it's very, very detailed, very long, a lot of scripture that I went over. But uh, we're not going to go over everything here today. If you want more detail, you can listen to the other message. But this morning, we're just going to talk about some of these main prophecies that are given. Okay, we're going to start out at verse 3. Matthew 24, verse 3, and it says here, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Okay, they wanted, they wanted to know what would be the signs of Christ's coming. Now, obviously, he was there, so they weren't talking about his first coming. They were talking about his second coming. Okay, um, verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now you'll see that even in the Pauline epistles, that deception is mentioned over and over and over again. Now what time period in history was there a greater level of deception than there is today? We have television, which is able to deceive huge masses of people. In the past, it was all word of mouth. You didn't have that that uh, tool for control that they do today. And you have it on the Internet as well. There's so much deception on the Internet. I mean, there are so many false prophets and so many false websites that just mess people up. That's a shame. It didn't used to be that way. Okay, for thousands of years, it would have just been... The only way you could have really been deceived is by some false prophet coming into the area and and, you know... If you had a good, strong community with a good, strong church that's being taught the Bible and the people are Bible-believing, the false prophet wouldn't have been able to get to them. But now, people are... There, there's just so many traps. I mean, it'd be like walking through the, the woods with wild animals that are ready to get you and, and, the, and the ground is... is a, it's an old war zone and there's landmines everywhere that are still active. I mean, that's what this world is like. You know, they're... You get a, a Christian saved nowadays, there's probably about a 90-95% chance that they're going to get messed up in something. It's bad. And, and, you know, and I think all of us here could testify to the fact that we've fallen into some traps. We've hit some landmines down through the years. We've fallen for some false prophets and some, some things that weren't true. I know I have. So deception is a major, major thing. And um, I'll kick our president here. It's, there's a video I saw on YouTube the one time where Obama, they documented, he lied seven times in under two minutes. <laughs> one of the speeches he was given. Seven lies in under two minutes. And you look at the guy's career, it's just been one lie after another. And these politicians, they're, they're just a bunch of liars. They don't care about the American people. They don't care about your vote. They just want to pass their own legislation they have their own goals they don't care about the goals of the people and they're trying to get rich that's all they are politicians are wicked and corrupt um, let's look at verse 5 here I could go off on the politician thing all day verse 5 for many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many <coughs> now it's interesting because you actually have people act, that actually claim to be another Christ. Okay, you have the Catholic priests. That's part of their catechism, their their belief system. They believe that they are other Christs. A lot of the New Agers believe that they are Christs, and you know a lot of the char Charismatics also claim they claim that we are anointed. You know the the anointing. Well, the anointed one is what Christ means. So you have these people. That, I mean. Some of them, maybe not, but a lot of the really radical ones 
are actually claiming to be other Christs right now. Uh, but what about religious deception? What's religious deception like? Well, I said about it earlier. It's greater than it's ever been before. There's more religious con artists and, and religious deception now than ever before in history. And, you know, I'll be very honest with you. Most of the preachers out there today, I can't listen to them. It just, it goes against me. It's just, ah, man, I, I just can't listen to them. I don't want to waste my time on them. And I'm going to get into that and the reason why I can't listen to a lot of these false preachers and the reason why a lot of you can't listen to them either. I'm going to show you the reason why uh, at the end of this message. But let's look at verse 6. It says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The end is not yet. Okay? Wars and rumors of wars? How's that for today? We have Afghanistan. They say the war in Iraq is over, but I doubt that. I doubt it very highly. They're still there doing operations and whatever. But what about Iran? What about North Korea? See? There's rumors of wars. Now is that... You know, you say, well, there have been wars in the past. Yeah, but not like today. Not like today. I mean, there are so many wars going on right now and uprisings and riots and all kinds of other stuff. It's incredible. Look at verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. Okay, have uh, nations, are nations rising against other nations? Yeah. <laughs> and there's more than just a military type of war, too, I might add. There's financial war. You see, one of the best ways to destroy a country is not necessarily with missiles and soldiers with automatic rifles. A good way to destroy a nation is economically. You go in and you wipe them out economically. And if you haven't noticed, uh, America is under attack economically. And we're losing the battle. <laughs> okay, we're not going to win. Um, kingdom against kingdom, certainly we see that. Famines. What's the reason that they're revolting in Egypt? Famine. People can't get food. And when you can't get food, you really don't have much left to lose. You're starving to death. So they say, well, you know, what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to go against the people. Well, they, you might get shot. So what? I'm dying anyhow. <laughs> people that have nothing left to lose, lose it. You know, it's getting bad. Pestilences. There are man-made diseases. I'm not going to go off on that. But also things like diabetes and cancer have just absolutely exploded in the last 50 years. I heard a medical doctor saying the one time that uh, used to be that a child under 10 that had cancer, it was a rare thing, and doctors would actually fly, you know, hundred, hundreds of miles away. They would fly to the medical clinic to examine a child that was under 10 years old that had cancer. And now there are whole hospitals dedicated to children that have cancer. Why? Is pestilence on the increase? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know the actual numbers. I didn't take the time to research it. You can research it yourself. But I've heard numbers as much as 3,000% that things like diabetes have gone up. Just in the last, you know, 20, 30 years even. What's going on? Something's happening. Something is changing. What about earthquakes? In divers places. Okay, in other words, in many places, in, in a lot of different places. Well, according to the United States Geological Survey, they estimate that there are approximately 50 earthquakes every day worldwide. 50. And that's the ones that they're picking up. There are ones probably in remote areas that they don't have any seismographs nearby that they aren't even picking up. 50 earthquakes a day times 365 days. That's a lot of earthquakes. And they and it was funny because they said on the website, watch out for oppositions of science falsely so-called. 1 Timothy 6.20. you got to watch out for that. But they said on their website that well, earthquakes really, they're not increasing. These earthquakes, they, they've always been like this. We just didn't have the instruments in the past to read 
this many. Well, that's nonsense. Okay, any scientific, real, true scientific research shows that earthquakes are massively increasing. Why? What's going on? Is it maybe it's global warming? Maybe it's the you know whatever? No, because the Bible said so. God's doing it. All right. Verse eight. All these, all these things that we just went over, are the beginning of sorrows. It's just getting started. Isn't that amazing? All the crazy stuff that we've seen here, that we're seeing right now, it's just getting started. The ball is just starting to roll. <laughs> you know, the axe is just starting to fall. <laughs> you know, it's incredible. And if you remember earlier, we read about Acts chapter 2 verse 19 said, And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. So you're going to see things in heaven above and in the earth beneath. Now, one of the subjects I want to cover uh, here, a lot of people have a question about this, is what about all these bird and fish and animal deaths that you're seeing all over the world? And I have a paper here. This thing goes to January the 14th. And this is not accurate because there have been many since then. Okay, but this is all the, the list of all of the animal and uh, fish and bird deaths. And it actually, you know, people say it began in the new year. No, actually it started back in December of this past year. The first one uh, that they have listed here is happened December the 13th of 2010. Thousands of dead barramundi fish wash up in Australia. You know, I'm not going to read all of these, but it's thousands of fish and, and more than 100 dead pelicans turn up in North Carolina, December 22nd. Ten tons of mostly dead fish found in a fishing net in New Zealand. Hundreds of dead sea creatures, scores of dead fish. Uh, 70 bats found in Tucson, Arizona. That's the 28th of December. Dozens of fish found dead in San Antonio, Texas. Now here's the one that was reported on. Uh, December the 31st, 5,000 plus dead birds found uh, in Arkansas suffering from massive trauma and blood clots. And they said it was the fireworks. The fireworks from New Year's Eve because it was New Year's Eve. They found them the next day. Okay, January the 1st. Uh, I can tell you that's nonsense. Uh, fireworks going off is not going to cause massive trauma. They said basically that the insides of these birds were liquefied. That's not going to come from fireworks. Something major is going on there. Um, in the Arkansas River, just a little bit away from there, they found 100 plus thousand dead fish. Um, on the 3rd, the same day, 100 tons of dead fish wash ashore in Brazil. 100 tons. That's a lot of fish. A whole lot of fish. Washing up, and this is in Brazil. The same day that things are happening in Arkansas. What's going on? It's worldwide. Um, uh, tens of thousands of dead fish wash ashore in Chesapeake Bay, Maryland. And uh, we're going to hear this report a little bit later. I'm actually going to play this in just a few minutes here. But they claimed it was from a cold snap in the water. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely just, just stupid. I mean... If you don't know the truth, just keep your mouth shut kind of thing. Most of these, they say, it's unknown causes. They have no idea. Our modern scientists don't have any way of explaining this. And, you know, it goes down through d dead crabs, um, dead turtle doves found in Italy, starlings um, in Romania. Uh, this one's a good one. Dozens of dead starling birds turn up in Romania blamed on drunkenness. <laughs> Well, maybe it was, you know, God's judgment on the drunks over there. I don't know, but that would be the only way it could be blamed on drunkenness. Uh, but anyways, it just goes down through. Like I said, I can't read all of them. Um, the last one that's on the list here is January the 14th. 200 dead cows in uh, Wisconsin allegedly caused by a virus, they said. 200 dead cows just laying dead all over the place. And what they didn't report is on that exact same day, 
there were 7,000 dead buffalo in Vietnam. And a couple days later, it came, it went up to 13,000 dead buffalo. And the last report that I saw, this is in February actually, um, there were a couple thousand dead fish that died in the Amazon River. And they blamed it on the people that lived by the river. They had fires going and it, the ash from the fires went into the water and it deprived the fish of oxygen and the fish were sticking their head out of the water to get oxygen. That killed them. That was the scientific explanation. I mean, these people have no idea. You know, I, I often am amused by the thought of how they're going to explain the events of the tribulation. They're not going to be able to explain it. They're going to come up with all kinds of nutty nonsense. Right now, they have no idea. When they say unknown causes, that's partly true. What they should be saying is, it looks like God's wrath is coming soon on this planet. And you better get saved and you better get right. But of course they're not going to say that. And by the way, I'll say this before I continue. Most of mainstream media isn't even covering the animal deaths anymore. And it's still going on. Animal, fish, and bird deaths are still here. And I'm going to show you the reason for them. Turn back to the book of Hosea, one of the minor prophets in your Old Testament actually comes right before the book of Joel. Hosea chapter 4. Now, we've been over this before in our Bible study, but I'm going to read it here for, the, for you that are listening in on sermon audio. Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now this is written to Israel. okay? But remember this time period coming up, this, this time of Jacob's trouble, it's for the Jews. The tribulation time period is for the Jews. So these signs that we're seeing, the signs of the second coming of Jesus Christ, are specifically for the Israelites. Now we can see them. We know perfectly. We can see the day of the Lord approaching. And we can say, okay, at some point in time, we're not appointed to God's wrath. We're not going to have to go through that judgment. Our judgment came at Calvary. Okay, that's where your judgment comes. As a Christian, you get saved your judgment as far as heaven or hell is over at salvation. You're on your way to heaven. You're not going to lose your salvation. But things are different for the Israelites. Let's read here. Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Sounds like a lot of places here in America, doesn't it? By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Hmm. Again, sounds like modern day America. And this is the way things are over in Israel too, by the way. They're unbelieving right now. Verse 3. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea, also shall be taken away. Wow. Right there it is. Another sign coming to pass right before your eyes. And see, as Christians, we read this stuff and we say, yeah, we know perfectly. But the lost world, they don't have any idea. They're saying unknown causes. We don't really know for sure, and they're coming up with all these ridiculous theories, but we should know as a Christian. And you say, well, then what's this all about? Why is God doing this? Why is God allowing this? Well, I'm going to be a little bit graphic here, but all those pictures that you see of the dead birds and the dead fish, just piles of them, we are coming, well, not we, because we're going to be leaving, but the lost world is coming to a place in time, a point in time, where that's not going to be fish and birds and cattle. It's going to be people. Say, so what are you talking about? Revelation 9.18 says, By these three were the third, was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. The Bible gives a prophecy about an army that would come during this tribulation time period, that's going to kill one-third 
of all men. That's over 2 billion people. Now, don't tell me that those 2 billion plus people are going to be put in graves right away. They aren't. There's bodies that are going to be, if you could go through this tribulation time period, if you're lost listening to this message and you go through the tribulation time period, you're going to be driving down the road at some point in time. If you're not one of the ones that gets killed, you're going to be driving down the road and you're going to see whole towns that are wiped out by these armies, by this war that's coming, and you're going to see piles of dead bodies. Right now, God is sending the birds and the fish and the animals, the beasts of the field, and he's saying, this is what's coming. I'm showing you what's coming by these animals. But that's going to be people eventually. You're going to see people piled up like cordwood. You're going to see piles and piles of people. It's going to be the worst time period in history. That's what the Lord is showing by that. So, I mean, a third of all the people. And by the way, you read there in Revelation 9, and you'll see this judgment thing of a third of this and a third of that and a third of this. Why? Well, because man, as a wicked race of people, as, as a wicked group of people, man killed one-third of the Godhead. They put to death Jesus Christ. That's why that judgment is on one-third. He's, he's judging a third and a third and a third. I believe that that's the connection there. But you talk about bad, it's going to be bad. But I want to just play a little bit of this, the media thing here about this uh, massive bird and fish and animal die off. I'm going to play this and, and listen to the, what she says at the end, this news reporter. There's a little bit of music here at the beginning. It's part of a bigger video. It began on New Year's Day. Thousands of dead blackbirds rained down on an Arkansas neighborhood, like a scene out of Alfred Hitchcock's horror movie, The Birds. Experts say they died from blunt force trauma in the air. But what caused the trauma is a mystery. Then, as many as two million dead fish in Maryland. But the mystery is not just in the U.S. In the U.K., 40,000 velvet crabs littered the coast. Brazil, a hundred tons of lifeless fish floated. And in Sweden, jackdaws fell in the dead of the night. We reached the hill half an hour earlier and the road was completely clean. Then after half an hour the road was black and we became aware that the road was covered with dead birds or dying birds. Next came Italy. Over 700 turtle doves fell, echoing the Arkansas bird deaths. Some lay hanging in the trees. Here is one still alive. It let us take it, which isn't normal. This dove has a few hours of life left. Across the world, the bizarre phenomena of creatures raining down or washing up on shore has mystified scientists. For the two million dead fish in Maryland, they do have an answer. Our theory is that there was a very rapid temperature drop. Obviously, the, the, these are a type of fish that are, are susceptible to cold temperatures, but there was a very rapid drop. Poisoning, pollution, the cold snap, or something more sinister. If only birds could talk, the surviving ones would have a story to tell. Conspiracy theorists have had a field day, with talk of the end of the world being nigh. Only one thing is certain. The mystery of these mass deaths is yet to be solved. Tazine Ahmed, NBC News, London. Did you see how she did it? They had no idea what it is. But, at the end, you're a conspiracy theorist if you talk about the end of the world. Hmm. Now, let me ask you a question. How do you think she's going to report the rapture? I mean, she's, she's not saved, you know. I, I mean, I highly doubt that she's saved. How do you think she's going to report on the rapture? You know, when the conspiracy theorist Christians, the Bible thumpers, disappear and all the wicked apostates are still here. See, she's not going to say, I, I believe it was the rapture and, and you better get saved now because God's wrath is about to be poured out. Uh, -uh. They're going to come up with a bunch of idiotic theories for the rapture too. So there you have the bird deaths. It's God's impending judgment. God's saying he's allowing these birds, for whatever reason, there's a lot of theories out there why the why all these animals and birds and fish are dying. Um, 
But in, in reality, above everything, it's God allowing it to happen or causing it as a warning, saying all those piles of, of dead creatures, that's going to be people eventually. And the only way out of this thing is to get saved now. Now is the day of salvation. Now you better get saved so that you make it out at the rapture. And if you don't, there's not going to be anybody innocent entering into that tribulation time period. All the people that enter into the tribulation will have rejected Jesus Christ. They all deserve to go through it. Now, they can get saved after that. God's not closed the door of salvation. But if you make it into the tribulation, it's your own fault. Just as simple as that. Okay. Now, and by the way, as I stated earlier, I want to make one more point and then we'll continue to the next point. Um, one other point that I'd like to make is, and I said this earlier, that the media is covering up. You're not even hearing from the mainstream media. They're not even talking about all of these animal and bird and fish deaths anymore. They might make a passing little reference to it, but this should be this should be the main issue. They should be really trying to figure out what's going on here. And most of them, they won't even talk about it anymore. They got everybody's attention off on Egypt and on other countries that are rioting and on whatever else and on a bunch of stupid nonsense, celebrity gossip. What about all the, the deaths and everything? Now, if they can cover that up, don't you think they could cover up the rapture? A couple million, if that, you know, Christians disappearing? They could easily cover that up. They'll just get your attention on a bunch of other things. Now, there's another thing which has come out here recently, another issue that I want to talk about, and I believe this is also a prophecy that is being fulfilled, and that is what's called a pole shift. And this is also some pretty wild stuff. I have here an article. Um, they interview some different people here. I'm going to read it. It says... Uh, Let's see here. USF geology professor Mark Stewart said the magnetic field has been weakening for thousands of years, but what is happening now is part of a gradual shift of poles that has been moving for around 40 years. Uh, because a magnetic compass in Florida no longer points to true north, uh, TIA, which is the Tampa International Airport, has had to repaint their runways to account for the accelerating shift, said Brenda... Georg Hagen, Director of Public Information and Community Relations for TIA. They're having to repaint the runways down in Tampa because the poles are shifting, the poles of the earth. Um, it says here, when USF was just established here in Tampa in 1960, a compass needle would have pointed about one or two degrees east of true north, Stewart said. In 1980, it would have pointed one or two degrees west of north. Now, it points five or, or six degrees west of north. So, the poles are changing. And this could be a reason why there's a lot of this weird weather and a lot of the other things. And we're going to see from the Bible what this is about. But here's an interesting thing, and this is something that's pretty wild to think about. And I don't know, I you know... You can come to your own conclusions whether or not this thing is going to happen. It says here, through KTSM News Channel 9 in Texas, I'm sorry, though KTSM News Channel 9 in Texas reported that the Aurora Borealis may be visible from Florida, Stewart said that the poles are moving in the wrong direction for the phenomenon to occur. A northern light sighting, he said, could be catastrophic. The last time it was seen this far south was in 1959. It was visible in Cuba, he said. It's called a Carrington event, and it's this horrific solar storm. Back then, it actually induced such strong electrical currents in telegraph wires that the telegraph wires and poles were set on fire. If a Carrington event occurred in Florida today, Stewart said, it could leave the U.S. without power for many, many months. Now, if that happened, first of all, it would shut down all satellites, all GPS, all telecommunications dead, he said. The next day, as it built up strength, probably all those long wires that connect all of our electrical power plants would generate huge current surges that would wipe out all the transformers 
around North America, Northern Europe, Northern China, Korea, and Japan. We would basically lose all electrical power. It would take us about a year or two to replace the transformers. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Electricity wiped out for a year. What would the youth of today do? <laughs> They'd be running around talking about weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Man, <laughs> You know, they'd be holding dead cell phones trying to text and they wouldn't be able to. And, you know, it'd be horrible for them. <laughs> But what does the Bible say? Is this something that's going to happen? Isaiah chapter 24. Turn back to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 24, verse 19 through 23. We'll read that quick. And again, you know, this is prophecy specifically to the nation of Israel. These, this is written to the children of Israel. And we can see these events coming and in fact already starting. As Jesus said, these are the beginning of sorrows. You're already seeing start some of this stuff just getting started. It's the beginning of the sorrows that are coming upon the nation of Israel. We see some of that. We're not appointed to it. We're not going to go through everything But we are already in the initial stages of this. Okay, Verse 19. Isaiah chapter 24, verse 19. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall rise and not or it shall fall and not rise again. Under the authority of man is what the Bible's talking about. It's going to fall and it's not going to rise again. You see, all the great depressions, all the great wars and persecutions, the people were able to build themselves out of it. Okay, we had the Revolutionary War here in America. It We fell, okay, as as under British authority, but we rose again. This time, this nation, when it falls... If there is this Carrington event thing that happens, the people have lost the ability to live off the land, the majority of them. It always amazes me how the electric goes out for a couple days in the wintertime, and I hear of all kinds of people dying. A lot of people died. You know, 75 people died because of the winter storm, the blackout. Why? Something, a technology that we didn't even have 100 years ago, and now people die when they lose it? See, we're not strong now. Yes, knowledge has increased as the Bible prophesies back in the book of Daniel, but it hasn't made us stronger as a people. Most people have no ability to survive anymore. They've lost that survival instinct. For thousands and thousands of years, man has been able to take what's out in nature, what God has provided, and make a home and make food and make clothing. We can't do that anymore. So this time, when this world falls... It's not going to rise again. Only Jesus Christ is going to be able to rule the millennial kingdom. Believe me, the post-millennial teaching is nonsense. Man is never going to bring in a thousand years of peace out of the ashes of, of all the societies breaking down uh, right now. But let's go back to Isaiah chapter 24. Look at verse 21. It says here, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Hmm. You know, we talk about the thing of the Illuminati. A lot of people say it's a conspiracy theory. It's not a conspiracy theory. They were an actual group. And yes, they still have power. Through the CFR, through the Bilderbergers, through the Trilateral Commission, there's all kinds of groups. The Masons, the high-level Masons, low-level Masons don't know what they're part of. But these groups are out there. They are real. It's not a conspiracy theory. I've spent many years researching it. But what's the Bible say there? The Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, the principalities, okay, and Satan himself, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. That's why in Revelation chapter 6 and chapter 19, you see the kings of the earth hiding themselves underground. It's all, it's all there. I mean, a lot of Christians are scared to death to research some of this stuff. You know, and they, and they don't, most of your modern churches, they will never mention this stuff to you because they're scared to death of it. But 
I'm not afraid of it. Why? Because it's Bible prophecy being fulfilled. It's right there. To me, see, I'm not to be ignorant of the day of the of the times and the seasons. Okay, that's what we're looking at right now. We're looking at the times. What's going on here? But let's finish up here in Isaiah. Look at verse 22. And they shall be gathered together, the kings of the earth and the high ones, they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison and after many days shall they be visited. Now what's that? Well, if you read Matthew chapter 25, you have the judgment of the nations. Okay, now I talked about in another message the coming military dictatorship. And I talk about how that we come back as an army. We're mentioned in the book of Joel chapter 2. And we go out and we gather all people to be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ. And those that are faithful and saved, essentially, they go to the right hand. They are the sheep. They inherit the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. Those that go on to the left hand are the goats. It's interesting because the Satanists, one of their sacred animals that they worship is a goat. It's another issue. But they go on to the left hand, and where do they go? They go down to hell for the thousand years. And what happens at the end of the thousand years? They come out to the great white throne judgment. That's what you're seeing there in verse 22. They're gathered together by the army of the Lord, and as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison, there you have them down in hell in the heart of the earth, and after many days shall they be visited. They're going to be down there weeping and wailing, gnashing of teeth for a thousand years. All the rich men right now that have all that they want, the mansions, the money, everything else, they can have it <laughs> because that's what is coming very soon. They're almost finished. And after many days they will be visited. They're going to be taken out and judged at the great white throne judgment and then cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. Verse 23, Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. Hmm. Didn't we read about that before there, that Peter read about that? He was saying that, quoting the scriptures from the book of Joel, and he said about the sun and the moon being darkened. The scripture ties together perfectly. And this is not a man-made book, by the way. There's no way anybody could write a book like this and have everything just tie in and tie in with events that didn't even happen yet. This book, the King James Bible, was written 400 years ago. They could not possibly have known about all of, all of these events coming to pass. And there's no way. This is God's book. Okay, We've been given a more sure word of prophecy. It's right there. And the page is right in front of you. I mean, it's... Man... Just an amazing thing. And it's interesting because God himself is starting to reveal his power. And yet how many people are turning to him? And you'll read that in the book of Revelation. God is dealing with people over and over and over again and they don't repent. Just phenomenal. Okay, that was the times now. Okay, we see the times. We see that the second coming is approaching. Now let's look at the seasons. Turn back a little bit more to this, the book of Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon. You know, a lot of people wonder, why is this book in the Bible? You know, it's, it's one of them things that a lot of it is for private study. I don't, you know, think you should be reading it necessarily up in front of everybody. There are a lot of things in there that, you know, you kind of scratch your head and you say, why on earth would the Lord take time to write about this? Why would he put this in here? Well, because in symbology, I do believe that uh, it's a picture of Christ and his Gentile church. Let's look at verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5. And it's written basically from the standpoint of a woman, one of Solomon's brides, his favorite bride, actually. And she says here, I am black, but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon, look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. 
Now, if you studied through the, the book there and you study the Bible, so, uh, King Solomon's favorite wife was the daughter of Pharaoh. So what was she? She was African, North African, a Hamite. And that was his favorite wife. And, of course, she turned his heart away from the Lord. But the point is, what's given here is you have a Jewish king with a Gentile bride. It's kind of amazing when you think about it that the Lord would use a black woman to symbolize uh, the church, the Gentile church. Kind of weird. Uh, but look at chapter 2, verse 10. It says here, My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Hmm, interesting. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Verse 13, The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Now, there are, are some theories there that perhaps that this is a reference indirectly to the rapture, and maybe the rapture will happen in the spring. Well, I can't be dogmatic about that. I hope it's true, but I don't know. I mean, it's it's an interesting thing, definitely. And there, you know, you can really get into a lot of things there. And some people would say, well, then, do you believe in Harold Camping and his May twenty first, two thousand eleven thing? Uh, no, because you see, Harold Camping is not predicting the date of the rapture. He says it's the rapture, but what he is really is saying is that. It's the rapture and the second coming. See, Harold Camping is a very wicked false prophet. And I'm going to read some of his stuff right here. I went to his website, familyradio.com. And I've, I've known people that have gotten very messed up by this man. He is very, very wicked. And I can tell you that if his salvation, quote unquote, is what he gives as the plan of salvation on his website, I can tell you right now he's lost. He's not a Christian. If this is what he believes for salvation, he is he is completely lost. Okay, we have here Judgment Day. And he, he uses this term all throughout this thing that I printed out. This is a PDF file on Judgment Day. And all throughout he says, Holy God said this or said that or Holy God wrote this or Holy God. He doesn't say the Holy God or our Holy God. He just calls him Holy God. Holy God. Um, that wording does not appear anywhere in the Bible. One time, I think in the book of Ezekiel, it says, N Holy God. But it, God has never has the title Holy God. So he's using this, this strange title for God. But he says here in the second paragraph, he says, in its original languages, mostly Hebrew and Greek, he's talking about the Bible. Uh, it has never been changed, and each and every word in the original languages is from the mouth of God. <laughs> so you can see what his foundation is. He talks about the Bible being perfect, but in the original languages. Okay, he's an Alexandrian pervert, um, which I've covered in other studies. He says here about salvation, he says, For more information on this subject, you may request a free copy of I Hope God Will Save Me. That's his salvation uh, booklet that he puts out. I hope God will save me. Isn't that something? I hope he will. <laughs> it's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you can know that you have eternal life. Um, he says here, another page, We learn from the Bible that Holy God plans to rescue about 200 million people. That is about 3% of today's population. Uh, chapter and verse. Where in the Bible does it say that 200 million people are going to be saved? He doesn't give any scripture references, of course. On the first day of the day of judgment, May 21st, 2011, they will be caught up, raptured into heaven because God had great mercy for them. This is why we can be so thankful that God has given us advance notice of judgment day. Because God is so merciful, maybe he will have mercy on you. Maybe. He will have mercy on you. So in other words, Harold Camping is not teaching that the rapture happens and then comes the tribulation. 
he teaches that the rapture, you go up and Jesus comes down. That's what he's teaching. Okay, His prophecy of May 21st, 2011 is easily debunked because the prophecy has no basis in Scripture. There is no rapture where you go up and Jesus comes down. Okay, That's not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Just not in there. It's ridiculous. And the thing of 200 million people, where's that at? It's crazy. But I want to show you some of what he teaches as salvation here. Just also to, to mark Harold Camping as a false prophet, a very wicked false prophet. And, you know, this is a, a strong rebuke for him and for his followers. He says here, Turn away from your sins and humbly beg, beseech, and implore God for forgiveness. And thank God in his great mercy, he has given you this warning of the destruction that is almost here and the great hope that you too might be one whom God will bring to heaven to be with God forevermore in the highest happiness and joy and glory. Holy God in the Holy Bible teaches us in Luke 18 verses 10 through 14. And it goes into the story of the publican and the Pharisee and how the publican said, God be merciful to me a sinner. But Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross at that point. And in all of his salvation issues, he never mentions Jesus Christ once. Never does he tell anybody to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Doesn't tell you that. Why? Because he's a wicked devil. Plain and simple. Here's a whole book on salvation. Another thing I printed out from their website. You can get on there. You can look this stuff up. Page 68, he says, and he's talking about three groups of people, those who reject the word and all this. Stuff. And then the third group is those who humbly believe the Bible is to be obeyed. Okay, now this is some of the stuff he, he is saying that you need to do for salvation. He says, they hope that possibly God might have mercy upon them. And then he quotes Luke 18, verse uh, 13 again. Now, notice the, well, we don't really know for sure. See, a false prophet is somebody that teaches doubt. It says they try to be obedient to all they understand of the Bible, knowing full well that their obedient actions do not contribute in any way to salvation or guarantee that God will save them. Huh? And then he says, too, uh, that they, too, might possibly become saved. You might possibly become saved. See, this is a false prophet. This man is not a saved man. They might be as obedient as possible to the law of God. Huh? It could be that could be that God is drawing them in preparation to save them. See, this guy's a hyper Calvinist. Okay, he's a nut. And it says here we must remember that anyone at any time, anyone. At any time who obeys any of God's laws is doing spiritual work. But that work can never be a con contribution to one's salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Salvation will come only to the elect. And the business of election is strictly God's business. That is why God can save a baby. Uh, yeah. <laughs> God will save a baby. If a baby dies, any baby, I don't believe that they go to hell. I don't believe that there is a such thing as a baby in hell. They haven't reached the age of accountability. But this guy, this nut, says that is why God can save a baby. This guy doesn't know, he doesn't know any more than a Catholic. He doesn't know any more than a heathen, any more than a dog walking around. Well, I don't really know for sure if I'm going to go to heaven. Well, you know, you're supposed to know. I'll finish up here. It says, In God's mysterious providence, He gives spiritual ears to the elect. Yeah. In their obedience, they are praying for God's mercy. They are patiently waiting upon God, hoping that they too might become saved. In their desire to be obedient, they are at least in an environment, the Bible, wherein God will save them if God so desires. <laughs> if God desires? God will save them if He desires? What about the thing of God's not willing that any should perish. You know, the grace of God which bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. This guy's a nut. Today, in his great and wonderful mercy, God is saving a great multitude of people. 
It is possible, therefore, that as any one of us humbly pleads for mercy, if we are not already saved, we might be one of those included in that great multitude which no man could number. The big question is, are you humbly begging God for salvation? May God have mercy on each one of us. Again, both pages 68 and 69 of his salvation message, the name Jesus Christ doesn't appear once. Not once. This man is not preaching Jesus Christ to a lost world. He is preaching a heretical, damnable heresy. Harold Camping is a lost, false prophet. If you're one of his followers, you better run away from that devil as quick as you can. One more place in the Bible, then we're done for today. John chapter 10. And I don't know if you've ever heard Harold Camping speak, but it's this monotone, droning, low voice that he just talks just like that and he just reads from the Bible and just... Oh, I can't listen to the guy. I can't listen to that man for more than about two minutes without feeling sick in my stomach. And a lot of these, you know, there are, I'm sorry, and this might get me in trouble, but whatever. There are a lot of false prophets on sermon audio. And a couple of times I've clicked on sermons just trying to listen. I can't listen to them. Something about their voice. It's interesting. We're going to see why that is here in John chapter 10. There's just something about the voice of a false prophet that as a Christian, it should be repulsive to you. It should just be like, ah, man, shut that guy off. That's how we should feel. John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Hmm, very interesting. Verse 4, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. They didn't understand. Jesus is not talking here about the second coming. He's talking about the rapture. That's why they didn't understand. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. It was a mystery. Okay, verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. He identifies what the door is. Verse 8. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus says, by me is salvation. The Bible says that there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If anybody comes to you and is preaching salvation and they don't name the name of Jesus, they're a false prophet. Run away from them. Don't listen to them. Okay, verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. You know what's amazing to me? How many Christians that I get letters from, emails from, and they say, I can't find a good church. There aren't any good churches in this area. None of them want to talk about the evil. None of them want to talk about the issues of the day. It's all this Laodicean, sissy, lukewarm nonsense. You know why? Because those preachers are career preachers. They're hirelings. They don't have any real love for the sheep. They're up there. They want to make money. And one of the prime issues of making money is the customer is always right. You do things to please the customer. Nobody ever went into a business, started a business... And did things that were negative. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you don't beat up on your customers because they won't come back. But as a preacher, you're not to beat up on them, on your people as, as, as a pastor. 
but you are to warn them, to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. It's right there. But we have hirelings right now. Verse 13, the hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. You should know that you are saved. If you don't know, get it worked out. Okay? You should know. If you don't know, the Bible says that you're a reprobate. Okay? It should be there. And if you are going to a church where you have an hireling as a pastor, if you are going to an incorporated, government-incorporated church, you know, I, I've said some things this morning about politicians and, and political things and the Illuminati and whatever else. You know why I can do that? Because I'm a free man. Bible Believers Fellowship is not a government corporation. Bible Believers Fellowship does not exist as a money-making entity. I'm not in this as a career that I'll eventually retire from and go vacation in Bermuda. Okay? I'm going to stick with this thing. I'm not a hireling. Okay? I want to point people to Jesus Christ. I got called by some wicked false prophet this week. He called me Jim Jones. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Jim Jones controlled people. He said at one point, Jim Jones raised up the Bible and he said, you don't need this book. And he threw it out into the congregation and he said, if you need a savior, I will be your savior. If you need a God, I will be your God. Now you're never going to hear me say that. Okay. And I'm never going to tell people to drink Kool-Aid and commit suicide. <laughs> you know, I mean, give me a break. But see, that's how a, a wicked lost person will view somebody who's King James only. They view me as a cult leader. I'm not a cult leader. Give me a break. You know, but that's what you have right there. A hireling will not warn people about things that are coming. Hey, I, you know, I'd love to talk sometime about the nice little stories of the Bible and let's talk about um, blind Bartimaeus or, you know, let's talk about uh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and let's tell neat little stories and applications for life and, you know, how to get along. But I can't, I can't break away from the fact that we are living in the last days and things are getting worse and worse and worse. And for me to talk about something, to talk about pretty nice little subjects while there's major problems and the sheep are going, what's going on? Does this line up with the Bible? For me to, to not talk about what's going on, I can't do it. You know, and a lot of, a lot of people aren't going to want to listen to this just simply because it's negative. But I'll tell you right now, if you're a Christian, if you're saved, you know that this is actually positive. All this stuff I was talking about this morning, because it proves Bible prophecy. We have been given a more sure word of prophecy. And if the prophecy is right, then we can know also that salvation is right. It all goes hand in hand. It all ties together. So I guess that's it for this morning. Listen to the voice of Jesus. And, and let me just tell you something. I believe very strongly in the power of the Holy Spirit, power of the Holy Ghost, if you want to say that. I don't believe in sign gifts, but I do believe that the Lord will speak to you about certain things. And one of the ways that he will speak to you is when you hear the voice of an hireling, something within you, and it's not an explainable thing, it's not an audible voice that talks to you, but something within you will go, ugh. That voice, it'll just, something will irritate you and you'll just be like oh, man i don't want to hear that the bible says we went over this in first thessalonians chapter 5 quench not the spirit if you hear a voice from a preacher quote unquote and it's it's irritating and grating and just like oh i don't want to listen to this guy if you hear that don't quench the spirit shut him off don't listen to it just say you're a hireling. I don't want anything to do with you. And by the way, Harold Camping, one of his motivations here, he's saying, the rapture's coming. So what's the purpose of you having a big bank account? Send me your money. And some guy, you know, brother on YouTube, made a video and he said uh, to Harold Camping, he said, you're a very rich man. And he said, so you believe the rapture's coming May 21st? Why don't you send me some money? Instead of asking for money, why don't you give all your money away? Isn't that weird? 
Harold Camping's not giving up all of his riches. He's telling other people to give up their riches. You know why? Because he's a hireling. You hear that voice? The Holy Spirit will show you a false prophet. You won't be able to listen to them. Don't quench the spirit and say, I'm just going to keep listening. Don't do that. He's building a bigger barn. Yeah. So I guess that's it for this morning. Stay in the Word of God. I'm telling you, that's that's the best way to not be deceived. Spend your time in this book. Listen to it. Read it. Study it. And watch out for the false prophets and the hirelings. Uh, one other point uh, that was brought up here quick, and I just want to include this into the sermon, is that the thing of the, an irritating voice doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you get some Baptists that have kind of a, a an abrasive way to them. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a false prophet, okay? Uh, the Bible talks about a a false prophet having coming to you in good words and fair speech and deceiving the hearts of the simple. That's uh, Romans 16, is it? Yes, Romans, yeah. I'm getting it here. Um, but uh, they will deceive. What's the point of them using good words and fair speech? It's to get your money. That's a hireling, okay? But even with a hireling with good words and fair speech, it says that they deceive the hearts of the simple. Okay, if you're wise, you're not going to be deceived as quickly by them. A hireling that's in it for the money, they will have an irritating voice, but even kind of an effeminate voice and good words and fair speech. And if and you can tell, a lot of these guys, you can tell they will build you up to a point where they try to sell you something. You know, you take a Benny Hinn or a John Hagee or people like that. They build you up and they tell you just got to have this latest book. Okay, what was what was the verse? Uh, ahead, Romans Rachel. sixteen eighteen. It says, "For they that are such serve not the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple." And yeah, that's Romans sixteen eighteen. Yeah, very good. Yeah, very good point. And um, that's you know I wanted to include that in here as an important final point that it isn't just a, an irritating abrasive voice; it can be a good words and fair speeches. If you see them building you up to a point where they start trying to get your money, look out. <laughs> okay, that's also the voice of an hireling. So that's something that's important to keep in mind. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.